Hey guys, what's up? It's Alex over at Laser Everything, and you, you've probably guessed it by now. We're doing the rotary tool today. Yes, today is the day. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to get this thing up and running. We're gonna set it up completely from scratch. I mean, seriously, like from the controller board from scratch. Every step along the way, I'm gonna show you how to do all of it. And by the end of this video, you're gonna be able to mark on a steel tumbler just like this one. We're gonna do the whole thing start to finish, so do not go anywhere. This is seriously a video you don't want to miss and we're going to get started right now. Before we jump into this, I do just want to say that this video is intended for absolute beginners. We're not going to get into some of the advanced rotary mark features or parameters. So this is just to take you from you've opened a box and you've got your rotary tool to getting your first mark on the cup. We'll probably do an intermediate style video down the road where we cover some of the more advanced topics a bit more in depth. But for today, we're just going to get this thing turned on working with EasyCAD, which is a tall enough order in and of itself, and get your first mark on a tumbler or something similar. So bear with me if you already know all of this stuff. Uh, again, we're just trying to help the beginners out today. We're trying to get things just working. We just want to get stuff working. All right. Let's get into the video. Okay guys, here it is. The bane of so many of your existences, the rotary tool. We're gonna to talk all about this um, and we're gonna get started with just getting it set up physically uh, because there is a little setup and just getting this thing to sit in the right place, uh, you know, to get some work done. So we're gonna jump into that first. So you just saw that my rotary tool was at the top coming down um, and now I've moved it over to the left side coming across uh, and there's a reason for that and we're going to talk about it, but I do feel like you get a little more space to work when you're coming out across this way. Uh, so I've gone ahead and moved mine over here. So everything that you see from now on in the, my settings and stuff, when we get into that, it's going to be with this orientation in mind. All right. So I just wanted to point that out. I also just wanted to make sure to say that it's important that you bolt your rotary tool down. Um, I have gone ahead and bolted mine down with M6 screws because that's the screw size on my board. Uh, you just need to know the screw size on your board and you can go ahead and bolt these down uh, and you just you don't want it moving once we get it set where we want it we want it to stay until we're ready to move it again you don't want to tighten them all the way down yet because we're going to make a couple changes but go ahead and get them most of the way there uh, so that it's not just like flopping all over the place and then we'll move on to the next step the other thing we have to talk about is the controller and the controller is actually telling the stepper motor on your rotary tool what to do in my case, I ordered my rotary tool after I ordered my machine, so my controller is inside this box. Uh, but you may have gotten the rotary tool with your machine and bought them at the same time. If so, your controller is inside your machine. And uh, if that's the case, I'm going to have special instructions for you along the way, uh, but it's not going to be very different from what we're doing here. So here's the back of your controller box and there's a couple different things going on. The first is the power. So go ahead and get your controller plugged into power. It needs power. If yours is inside of your machine, it gets power from the machine. Then we have a small connector and a large connector. Okay, the small connector is going to go to your rotary tool. This is sending instructions to the stepper motor. The large one is going to the machine. This is receiving instructions from the laser engraver. All you need to do is take the small cable from the back of your rotary tool and pop it into place on your controller, just like that. Then you're gonna take the large connector and that terminates here at the back of the machine into one of these three or four pin connectors that go into the actual laser engraver itself. Uh, and you're gonna connect that to the machine and then you're gonna connect this one right here into that slot. There's only two ways that this can fit, okay? Uh, there's there's not a lot of ways you can mess this up. You can't put these in backwards or upside down. They only go in one way. Also, I just want to point out these two connectors that go to the back of the controller are identical if your controller is inside of your laser. They're the same exact connections. Uh, they're just, these are external, those are internal. So if you need to install this internally for some reason, these connectors are the same. So that's not changing either. These little dip switches here, we're gonna talk about these in a minute, but these are very important. So just make a note where those are because we're gonna come back to that in just a minute. Once you have all of these devices connected, turn on your laser and then go ahead and turn on the back of the controller. Now that everything's in place, I'm just gonna go ahead and move our controller box out of the way. So we're just gonna slide these wires back here 
uh, so they're not interfering while we're trying to work. And we can just pop our box right back there and it's gonna sit there and stay right there. And we can shift our attention back over here to the rotary tool. Okay guys, so now that we have everything plugged in and turned on, what we wanna do next is uh, straighten and level our tool. So uh, in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to first, we're gonna straighten, we're gonna grab our line tool right here and we're just gonna follow this center line right in the middle. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click here we're gonna drag that straight across to the other end. And we wanna get it perfect because we're basing our straightness off of this. And then we're gonna right click and hit finish. And we're gonna light this line. We're not doing any special rotary stuff yet. We're just lighting a line straight across the board. And we're gonna head back over to the machine and take a look over there to see what this is gonna do for us. We're now gonna use this line that we've drawn as a guide to make sure that our rotary tool is nice and straight. And what we want is some kind of dowel or pipe or something that we're gonna be able to see that line on pretty clearly. And we're gonna put that in the jaws of the rotary tool and tighten it down. When your chuck is completely closed, all three teeth should meet perfectly in the middle. If your teeth don't meet in the middle like this, there's a misalignment. I'll link to a video below that will show you how to install the teeth onto a chuck the proper way. That way you can go ahead and get that taken care of. And then we will uh, come back here and we can pick back up where we left off. What we want to do now can be a little difficult, but the name of the game here though is to get our little pipe or dowel completely straight right down the middle. Uh, and here we can see that uh, we're not quite center, but we're pretty straight and straight is good. So as long as it's straight, we're in pretty good shape. So once we have it straight, we can just use our arrow keys on our keyboard to get that right into the middle. And then we can straighten once again. Once that's straight, guys, we want to go ahead and tighten these down the rest of the way because we don't want this to move at all. So go ahead and tighten these down on both sides. And now we know that's not going to move. The next thing we need to do is level this. Now, if we are doing something thin like this that's flat all the way across, um, we can just pop a level on this and call it a day. But if we're doing something like a tumbler or a glass, uh, we want to level the tumbler or the glass, not necessarily the stick here. So um, we're going to be doing a tumbler today. So I'm going to throw a tumbler on here and then we're going to uh, go ahead and level it after that. So I'm just going to go ahead here and remove our pipe from the jaws. This is why it's important to make sure that you're tightened down all the way, because if you're not tight on your screws that are mounting it to the board, just the force required to open the jaws will move you this tool. So you really want that locked down hard. Here we've got the tumbler we're going to be working on today. And what I want to do is just feed this over the jaws just like this. And then we're going to open the jaws up from the inside to hold onto the cup. So that's how we're going to be tackling this. And I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Now we know we're perfectly straight because we straightened it with the pipe and we locked our bolts down nice and tight. So all we have to do is get it level and we'll take our stair it here and we're going to just set that on. And you can actually see, even though this was pretty close to level with the pipe, because of the curve of the cup, uh, we're definitely a little high on the uh, on the back end here. So what we're going to do next is go ahead and level out the rotary tool. And I'm going to show you how to do that. In order to get this to move up and down freely, we have to loosen these. Now, we don't want to loosen them a ton because we don't want this to slam down and hit the table. Uh, well, I'm going to put our hands here just to be safe. Um, and this is, again, guys, a good reason to really make sure that these bolts down here are tight to the table because we don't want the torque that we're applying to these screws to uh, move our, our rotary tool, right? So there we go. Now we have freedom of movement here. I've set things down gently so that we can raise them back up. And what we want to do is we want to place our level where we want it to go. We're marking this area of the cup. So this is the most important part uh, to be level here. And then we're just gonna go ahead and raise it until we see our bubble show up. While I'm trying to level this, I have my Allen wrench here ready to go. So that the second that we hit it and it's nice and level, we can go ahead and start tightening it up. And there we go, no hands, nice and level. And then don't forget to tighten the other one as well so that all of the stress isn't on the, uh, the one bolt there. So now we're level uh, and we know that we're straight. So we're ready to actually move into EasyCAD and set this thing up. We're gonna start talking about hatches and settings in just one second. But before we do, I just wanted to also point out that this is the ideal time to focus because we have our lineup line. So we're just gonna light our line one more time straight across the cup and we're gonna focus 
not to the cup itself, but actually to the line. So it's actually gonna be a little away from the center of the lens, but it will be in the center of our workspace. So we're gonna focus right on this line. That way we know exactly where the laser is gonna come down and we're gonna get great focus out of this. Now we've got our center line here and this can be nice if you need to center something up on like a Yeti, you're trying to center with a logo or whatever, you know where that center line is. So this is gonna be perfectly center with your cup and your rotary tool. So you may wanna leave this in, um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna paste our artwork in and here it is, and we can't just hit shift center like we normally do because that's gonna be off center to our center line. So I'm just gonna select our line with shift and then we're gonna do modify and we're gonna align and we're gonna do it to the horizontal center. And that's gonna snap it right down onto that line. So now we know our artwork is center with that line that we use to straighten our rotary tool, okay? With that done, we can get rid of the line. We don't need that anymore and we certainly don't wanna mark it. And we've got our artwork here. Uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is how we're going to hatch. Now, you can experiment with these things, but this is the one that I've had the most success with. So I'm just going to share these settings with you now. Uh, and you can start here and then you can branch out and experiment with different, you know, line distances and hatch settings and things like that um, as you see fit. So uh, the first thing that we're doing is our hatch pattern here. So the hatch pattern we're gonna be doing here is gonna be the alternating uh, snake style one. So um, we've got blue lines coming back and forth and we've got red lines connecting them. So it's not actually gonna be marking the distance between the lines, we're just doing the lines straight up and down. That's all we're doing uh, on this hatch pattern. And uh, we've got a standard line distance right now of 0 0.025. So that's the one we normally use. There's nothing too weird here yet. You'll notice my angle is zero degrees. I usually love 45 degree angles. We do 45 and negative 45 to get a nice cross hatch. Uh, and that doesn't work very well on the rotary tool. It makes it really obvious where the rotary tool is turning. So for today, we're just gonna be setting this angle to zero degrees. That's straight up and down. It's just gonna go back and forth, up and down. And the reason we're gonna be doing that is because as the rotary tool is turning and the galvo is going up and down, you're not gonna be able to tell where one line went up and then it rotated and the next line came down. If you do 45 degrees, these 45 degrees as it's running and rotating may or may not line up. And that could look really bad um, and we don't wanna see those lines. So we're just gonna keep it straight up and down. That's a zero degree hatch. We're coming straight across. Every time it turns, you're not gonna see those lines because we're coming up and down every single time. So we're doing the zero degree hatch today. Like I said, you can experiment if you want to, but these are gonna be just kind of like our general settings. Also, we're gonna be disabling hatch two and three. We're not using them, we're not doing any cross hatching. It's just that first hatch at zero degrees. Um, we're also gonna come into our library here and we're just gonna pick our aluminum general setting. Again, this is just kind of for demonstration purposes. You're welcome to try out a multitude of different settings that may or may not work. But I know for a fact that we get a nice mark with this setting right now, um, the way that I'm gonna demonstrate it for you. So that's the one we're gonna go with for today. You can actually go ahead and hit the red light once you have your artwork in and it's gonna lay it out on the object and you'll get a sense of how big it's gonna be. It's not perfect obviously because it's not rotating, but it will give you an idea of where you're at so that you know you're ready to move on to the next step. So we know we're focused, we know what hatch we're using, and we know what settings we're using. So the next thing we need to do is actually open up the menu for doing rotary marks. And that's gonna be up here in laser. And there's a few different uh, plugins. So these are EasyCAD plugins. You don't really need to worry about any of them right now. The only one that we're concerned with is rotary mark. And that's rotary mark without a space in it. If you pick one of these other rotary marking plugins up here, they may or may not work the same way. Uh, and you'll have to do a little experimenting to figure them out. We can do videos on them uh, at a later date, but today we're doing this one, rotary, mark, no space. So we'll select that. And that's gonna open this menu up right here. So we're gonna go through this whole menu. There's a lot going on and it can be extremely overwhelming. I just wanna give a quick shout out to Tacky and Tony from the Discord. You guys saved my butt with this because I was so confused and I did not understand it at all. Uh, and the way you explained it really made sense to me. So with that said, I'm gonna do my very best to relay this information to you guys and try to help you understand it too. The first thing that you're gonna notice is that you've got these big black lines running straight through your artwork. Don't worry about them. It doesn't make sense uh, and it just, it means nothing. So just put it out of your mind, forget they're there. Uh, totally irrelevant. Uh, before we touch anything on this page, we have to make sure that our rotary tool is configured correctly. And in order to do that, we're gonna come down into this parameter menu right here. 
That's going to open up this window and there's a few different things we need to pay attention to. So as I initially showed you when we were setting things up, I had my rotary tool coming down from the top and then we moved it to the left and this is where that's going to matter. So because mine was coming from the top down, uh, I would have set this to X. This is just which axis we're rotating on. So if I'm going left and right, we're going along the X axis. That's the axis that's actually rotating. If we're going up and down, we're rotating along the Y axis. So since my rotary tool is going sideways here, uh, we wanna make sure that we set this to Y. So this is the Y axis, and we wanna make sure that's enabled. Uh, extension axis two, we're not using. We're only using one rotary tool, so we don't need to worry about that. So we're gonna stay here on one, we're gonna make sure it's enabled, and if you're coming from the left like me, we're gonna hit Y and we're gonna check invert. If you're messing around with these settings and you realize things are backwards, this is the first place you're gonna wanna check. Uh, so anything coming out backwards, you're gonna go ahead and check invert uh, or uncheck it, depending on how it's set. When we come down here, we see another setting called pulses per round. It may say steps per rotation. It may say pulses per revolution. Um, but what this is, is how many times the stepper motor has to turn in order to turn the stepper motor 360 degrees, so a full rotation. And this is probably the hardest part that I had uh, the toughest time figuring out. Uh, so I'm gonna try to make this as easy for you guys as possible. So on the back of your controller, do you remember those little switches that we saw? Those are called dip switches, and they control this number. By changing those switches, we can change how many pulses give us a full rotation. It doesn't really matter what it's set to, and that's a little bit more of a complicated topic for a future video. What matters is that the setting on your switches needs to match this setting here, the pulses per round. Uh, those need to be set to the same thing. Now we just have one through eight. It doesn't actually say which switches give us which value for this box. In order to figure out which switches we have to flip, we need to look for a chart that looks like this. Now on my rotary tool, this chart is actually on the underside of the controller housing. So if you take your controller housing and you just flip it completely over, it's on the bottom side and it can be a little bit hard to read. So you may wanna take a couple photos in different lighting so that you can just reference these numbers whenever you need to. If we take a look at the chart, we can see the first section tells us what switches one through three do. These switches are in control of the power. They control how much power our stepper motor is getting. Now, unless your stepper motor is making some kind of grinding noise when it's running um, or it's not turning at all, we really don't wanna mess with these. It's probably come from the factory ready to go. We don't need to mess with it. Uh, and there's no settings in EasyCAD that we need to know this information for. So we're gonna leave switches one through three alone. You'll notice on mine, I only have switch two depressed. Uh, and the way we're gonna read that is switch one, switch two, switch three. So my switch one is off my switch two is on and my switch three is off. So if we look at this chart, we can actually come down and we're gonna see off, on, off, and we'll know that my stepper motor is getting 3.5 amps of power. Again, this isn't really relevant, but I just wanna explain how to read the chart to you because it's gonna matter for the next section. So if we look down at the next section, we can see switches five, six, seven, and eight. What happened to switch four? Don't worry about it. Uh, again, it doesn't really apply to what we're doing today. So just ignore switch four for now. It's a more complicated topic for a future video. Changing switches five, six, seven, and eight are going to allow us to set how many pulses we get per rotation, okay? So what we wanna do is we want to look at our switches on the back of our controller, and we wanna match that to this chart. By default, it's probably set to something that's going to work well for your machine. If we look, we'll see that they read five, six, seven, eight, off, 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 on, eight is on. So if we come back to our little chart here, we can go ahead and read, we're looking for three offs and an on. And there it is at the bottom, off, 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 on. That gives us a value of 25,600. There is our answer. That is the number that needs to go into the pulses per round. Uh, that means that it's taking 25,600 steps to do a full rotation. Wow, that was a lot. With that said, you can customize this. You can change these switches to give you more or less pulses per revolution. Um, but we're not gonna do that today. We're gonna leave it at the factory default. We just wanna confirm what number it's supposed to be. Uh, so we're just checking against where the switches are actually set with what we have in EasyCAD. 
I hope that wasn't too confusing for you. If it was, drop me a comment down underneath the video or reach out to me on Discord because I'll be happy to help you understand it. I can definitely explain it again, um, maybe in a better way. But we're just matching this setting right here, the pulses per round. We want this to match what our controller is set to. I'd also like to just take a second and say, hey, Alex, I don't have a controller box. Well, your controller is still inside the machine and it is identical to the controller inside of our external controller box. All you have to do is open the side of the machine and find your rotary controller and read the chart, which should be printed on the controller itself. Here's a picture Tony sent me because Tony doesn't have an external controller box like we do. Uh, and he went ahead and sent me some photos of his controller inside the machine so you can see exactly where his dip switches are as well as his charts uh, which is where he was able to read the dip switches to make sure that they match in EasyCAD. This is going to be the number one thing that trips people up so again if you have any questions about this part of the process feel free to reach out to me and we'll try to get it handled for you. So now that we've put the uh, pulse rev behind us we can move on uh, distance per round we don't need to worry about um, because this is being set automatically for us by the pulses per round so we're not setting a distance to get around the 360 degrees we're letting the controller take care of that for us so we can leave this alone it shouldn't even be enabled and in order to disable this box if you have it enabled we're just gonna make sure that this box up here rotate axis is checked and when we check this box that says rotate axis it's gonna disable this completely so the next thing we need to tell EasyCAD is our gear ratio if you have a bunch of gears that are working together to rotate your rotary tool it can change how many pulses the stepper motor has to do to do a full revolution because the chuck is being driven directly by the stepper motor behind it, in this case, uh, we don't have to do any weird math. We know that every step that the stepper motor takes, the chuck is going to be taking as well. So we're going to set our gear ratio to 1. No funny math, nice and simple. Our part diameter we don't have to change right now because we can actually change that in the main menu. Um, so that's not a part of this initial setup in our parameters. We're going to touch base on that later, so for now, ignore that. So gear ratio one for most of us, rotate axis, we're gonna wanna make sure it's checked, which will disable this, and we can continue down these parameter boxes here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on these because they're not that important, but our minimum coordinate and our maximum coordinate just say, if I'm spinning the rotary tool, how far can I spin it before it reaches an end, a, a virtual theoretical end? Uh, right now mine's set to negative 1,000 and 1,000 millimeters, uh, and that's a lot. That's a really, really far distance. We're never going to use all of that, so that's fine. We can leave that there. Uh, there's plenty of space for us to work and do what we need to do with the set. Uh, we also have the minimum and maximum speed. These are the speeds that the laser is going to use when it's moving to a location. If we tell it to move 50 millimeters, this is how fast it's going to get there. Uh, it's also how fast it's going to rotate when it's rotating during operation. The minimum speed can be something like 100 pulses per second. Um, and the maximum, I have mine set to 5,000, which is pretty much the default setting when it comes to this. Uh, but you could lower this. You can lower this way down. There are people out there who say that lowering this to something like two to 500 even can improve accuracy and detail when you're engraving with the rotary tool. Uh, I haven't really had sufficient time to test that out, so I'm just going to leave mine set to 5,000 and uh, we can go ahead and move on. This box down here that says go to start position after finishing is just saying once our round object has turned all the way through the job, uh, do we want it to just sit there and be taken off or do we want it to return to where it started from? And if we want it to return, we're going to check that box. And we're just going to set our speed here to say how fast we want it to return. Again, the slower you set this, the more accurate the returning may or may not be. It's up for debate and experimentation, and I haven't gotten too crazy with this yet, but that's what it does. So you can mess around with that if you want to. Again, we're just gonna leave this at 2000, and we're gonna continue on. Our settings zero and accurate zero over here are only applicable if you have a homing system inside of your stepper motor. If your stepper motor doesn't home, you don't need to use this. I know for a fact that mine doesn't, uh, and it's a little bit of an advanced thing and those stepper motors are quite a bit more expensive so um, if you haven't heard anything about that you can probably just leave these at default and forget about it so just a quick correction um, i clicked this zero box when i was talking about what it is and uh, it threw a bunch of errors about the axis having to be homed we actually don't want that checked so i didn't mean to check that 
Uh, make sure that it's not the white box, but the gray one. We just need to leave it gray. This is what we want right here. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and hit okay. And that's gonna fix that problem. So if you're having that problem, that's why. Lastly, we have a few more advanced settings in here that are useful, but out of the scope of this video. So we'll talk about those another time. With all of this set up, your initial parameter settings are done. You did it, go ahead and take a screenshot so you don't lose the hard work that you just put in to setting this up. You'll notice a few familiar settings back in this main menu. Continuous, we'll just run and run until we stop it. Mark selected, we'll only mark the things that we have selected down here on the main screen. Um, and force all split and mark by split line. Uh, again, semi-advanced. We're just trying to get you up and running today so we can talk about these features another time. I'd also just like to take a second to point out that this invert checkbox is the same invert checkbox that we see in here in the parameter menu. If I uncheck it here and we hit OK, it's going to uncheck it on this menu. If I check it in this menu and we go into the param, it's going to be checked here. So this is the same button in two different places. I just wanted to point that out. We're almost ready to mark with our rotary tool, guys. Again, there's a few more boxes up here at the top that we're going to be kind of skipping over today because this is, again, just getting you marking. We're just trying to get you marking, so we're going to save these for an intermediate style video with a little more information. Uh, but the only thing that we really need to pay attention to up here is our split size. The split size controls how far your rotary tool is going to turn every time it marks. If we set this to one millimeter, our rotary tool is going to turn and then engrave one millimeter of our graphic. Then it's gonna turn again and rotate the next millimeter. And it's gonna turn again and do the next and the next and the next. If we have a graphic that's 10 millimeters long, it's gonna rotate 10 times. And each of those 10 times, it will engrave a one millimeter section of our graphic. Some people think larger split sizes are better. Some people think smaller split sizes are better. I haven't done enough extensive testing to say for sure which one is better, but I've had better luck with smaller split sizes. One of our most active Discord members, Tacky, really thinks that the best split size is your line distance of your marking. So we have a line distance of 0 0.025, and he likes to set his split size to 0 0.025 so that they match. That means for every line of the engraving, the rotary tool is going to do one little move. I find that takes a really long time, so I like to do a split size a little bit bigger than that, but it's still pretty small. For today's demonstration, we're using a split size of 0 0.05. Again, you're going to have to experiment with this to see what works best for you, but that's what the split size does. The last thing that we want to take care of is just setting our part diameter here. If we don't set our part diameter, our rotary tool won't know how far to move to get across a certain distance of the cup. It's really important this is accurate, so I recommend getting a caliper and making sure that it's big enough to actually measure the diameter of the cup. If your part diameter isn't correct, you're going to see split lines between sections of your engraving. So we just want to make sure that that's as close to accurate as possible. For my tumbler that we're doing today, we have a diameter of 87.5, so we've gone ahead and set that here, 87.5, and we'll hit OK. You can also set your focus length. That would be the length of your focal stick if you have one. That's how far you are from your lens to the surface of the material that you're engraving. I haven't actually set mine since I've set this up and started messing around with it, but it hasn't caused me any problems. So I'm not sure if it's entirely necessary, but that's what you can put in this box there if you want to. So now that we've got everything set up and we've got all of our settings in place, uh, we can go ahead and light this. Now we lit it from the main menu, the actual workspace earlier, and it laid out the graphic over the whole cup to give us a general idea of where things were gonna go. If we hit the light button while we're in the rotary mark tool, it's actually gonna rotate the cup a little bit and show us the starting position. And with that done, we can go ahead and uh, mark the cup. Between clips, I actually had to restart EasyCAD because it crashed on me because EasyCAD. Um, and I marked this with our default parameter here. Uh, but our default parameter actually is the aluminum general setting that we talked about earlier in the video. It's 1000 speed, 80 power, and 25 frequency. So um, that's okay. Uh, we marked the cup and it looks really good. So now we're just going to quit. We're going to quit this rotary mark dialog. And we're gonna come in here and we're just gonna select our anneal and we're gonna finish it with a steel anneal. It's a really nice look. I, I like the way that it comes out. So we're gonna come in here and we're just gonna check the steel anneal general setting and hit okay. That's 330 speed, 30 power, and 190 frequency. And then we're going to come back up to laser. We're gonna reopen our rotary mark and we're just gonna hit mark again. 
Since we have it returning to home at the end of the job, remember that's in here in the parameter, go to start position after finishing. Since it's going back to that starting position, um, we know that running this again, it's gonna go right over the top of what we've already done. So with our anneal settings selected, we can just hit mark and it's gonna go ahead and do that for us next. And here's our final tumbler, guys. That looks really cool. It's a really nice look. Um, as usual, we can clean this one of two ways. Uh, we can either hit it with some 3-in-1 oil, or we can just hit it with a little alcohol and a magic eraser, whichever you want to do. I'm going to go with the alcohol and the magic eraser because I did the 3-in-1 oil last time, um, and that looked good. There was nothing wrong with it, but I want to see how this comes out. So we'll go ahead and just grab our uh, magic eraser with a little bit of alcohol, and we're just going to go with the grain here and give that a quick wipe down. And we're gonna dry it off. And you can really see that anneal looks really good on there, right? Check that mark out. There's no big obnoxious split lines because our split was small. And we get kind of a nice cross hatch finish on there. Uh, this works with powder coated cups and the regular steel ones. So you can use this on whatever you want. And that's the final mark. So now you've got a working rotary tool. From here guys, wherever you decide to go with this is up to you. Uh, my advice is to just play with the settings, mess around with some stuff. You know what most of the basic things do and uh, you can start experimenting to try to get the best marks on the round objects that you want to engrave with your rotary tool. Okay guys, well, welcome to the end of the video. Hopefully you've marked your first cup or you're about to get started. If you're still a little confused about what to do, I recommend re-watching the video. It makes a little more sense the second time through once you've had a chance to kind of digest some of the information in it. Uh, if you would like a rotary tool just like mine, literally the exact one, there's a link down in the description. It works with most systems um, and it's the Mactron one great company. They make this 80 millimeter one as well as a couple smaller ones and you can find links to those down below. If you got value out of this video, make sure you hit the like button so that other people know that the content is good. And uh, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you get notified the next time I post a video. If you love the channel and this video saved your butt, consider becoming a patron. You can sign up right now and get instant access to my entire fiber laser and CO2 laser libraries. It's a really helpful boost if you're just getting started or you could expand your current library. Either way, it helps support the channel and make sure that I can continue making videos like this one for you guys. There's a link to the Patreon in the description right next to the link to our Discord community, our amazing laser community where people from all walks of life come together to celebrate lasers. Uh, the people in there are so friendly and so nice and they love having new people join the community. We share photos and settings and help each other out when we run into problems. So if you haven't already joined the Discord, it's free and it could be an invaluable resource to you. I think that's all we've got for today. This thing is a monster and it can be really stressful to set up, but I hope I got you at least some of the way there, if not all the way to marking your first tumbler. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.